Hello everybody, you are watching ADC English Literature. I am Ardhen Dude. Today, we are going to understand through critical analysis and comparative study William Blake's Holy Thrust, both the poems Songs of, of Innocence and Songs of Experience. We will see here how the atmosphere of innocence, purity and sacredness in the innocence poem is questioned in the experience poem. As you all know, there are two set of ideologies, experience and innocence and each of the poems has two different versions of telling the story. But before we start reading this poem, let's share a few words on Black's poetry. William Blake is an English poet and a painter and is best known to be one of the first figures of the Romantic movement or pre-Romantic movement, both in poetry and painting. His most notable works include Songs of Innocence and Song of Experiences that we are presently reading. It is a collection of different poems. Each of the theme is dealt in the subject of innocence and subject of experience. There is a, another long poem, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell and Jerusalem. These are all interesting works. Blake's poetry and work have a strong philosophical and mystical view. Portrayed in a very creative and expressive form and influenced by the ideas behind the American and French revolutions, his works are notably human. You know, the humanism or the characteristics of uh, finding out the person of telling the civilization in its core form that is the philo feelings love humanity among blake's poetry songs of innocence and experience need some clarification you know blake was a man of vision who saw ultimate truth at moments of great illumination vision is for him the great secret of life his entire work, poetry or painting is an attempt to develop this faculty of vision so that man seems to understand and thereby justify his actions and seek a divine glory. Simply, his innocence and experience songs are his visionary judgment. Judgment of life, judgment of spirituality, judgment of one's own religion or the version of one's own religion. Blake's poetry, Songs of Innocence, which was published in 1789 and Songs of Experience, which was followed after five years in 1794, are his best known works of poetry and have a lasting influence on children's as well as religious literature of adults. In Blake's Songs of Innocence, his extreme sense of freedom and happiness is equated with the condition of childhood. In these poems, notably most of the innocence poems, he says that childhood is the original state of happiness, ultimate enjoyment and unity. Some songs such as uh, the introduction and uh, the lamb, these kind of poems explore the innocence of children's understanding of God and this natural world. In his Songs of Experience, which was published in 1794, is quite a deviation from that innocence poems. He expresses his deep indignation at the hypocrisy and cruelty of the world. In the marriage of heaven and hell, he affirms the reintegration of the human soul divided by innocence and experience. So that poem can be a clarification of his innocence and experience journey. In the chimney sweeper and the garden of love, that sort of poems reveal the hardship of both children and adults uh, that they must confront in the unsheltered world of experience. So simply speaking, Blake's songs of innocence and songs of experience bring out two different human states of mind, you know. Innocence and experience now are not to a separate entity of us, but rather is a unified whole of, 
whole of us, in everybody, there is a journey from innocence to experience. From that journey, each and every man must pass through. And in the natural world, seeing the world and expressing it through the terms of worldly affairs is experience. Or seeing the innocence of spiritual aspects is the innocence feature. So the two human states of mind of the same person that are quite polar opposite to each other. They are polar opposite, they are interrelated. Each and every moment we are passing through innocence to experience and each and every moment we have the chance of making a journey from experience to innocence. So that kind of transformation of the tale of transformation is the innocent poem and experience poem. So being innocent or being a kind of inexperienced if I say is quite uh, opposed to the matured and well experienced state of mind. So the difference of perceptions of viewing this world, the sharp contrast of the experienced world and the ideal and imagined world of innocence of God is quite contrasting features. So the God's world or the spiritual world is innocence, whereas the experienced world or the worldly affairs of us is the experience. From the very title word Holy Thursday and the very words itself refer to Christian theme. There are uh, again the reference of Beatles, uh, a kind of church officials, the high dome is obviously St. Paul's Cathedral which is most venerated building where the children and their guardians present themselves for special religious services. And the little children raising their little hands towards the heaven and their singing in praise of God. It all refers to these Holy Thrust poems are religious poems. Now what is Holy Thrust? The Holy Thrust is for the Christian. It was on this day that Jesus Christ ascended to heaven. On Thursday of Holy Week, four events are commemorated. The washing of the disciples' feet, the institutions of the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist at the Last Supper, the agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, and the betrayal of Christ by Judas. The Holy Thursday referred to in the poem is Assassin Thursday, which is the church of England and other parts of the Anglican Communion can be used as a synonym for the same feast. There is a set pair of poems on Holy Thursday by William Blake. One is part of Innocence poem and another is in Experience poem. In the Innocence poem and the atmosphere of innocence, purity and sacredness throughout the poem make a new investigation into the innocence and purity. The children who are projected here are the school children. Their clean faces sustain a kind of heavenly idea that comes out of them intensified it wants and again it prompts to the God. The comparison of the child to flowers and to that of lambs and raising the hands towards heaven and singing of hymns, snow white words and the wise guardians also contribute a kind of maintenance of this holy atmosphere. It was on a holy Thursday, they are innocent, faces clean. The children walking two and two in red and blue and green. Grey-headed beetles walked before with wand as white as snow. Tail into the high dome of poles, they like Thames water flow. A special service is held in the church 
to commemorate Holy Thursday Day. Okay, on this day, the children of charity schools are given food and gifts. These they receive from the hands of their old and rich patrons. They are called wise because of their taking care of these children. Vigils also act as their spiritual guides. Their snow white wands agree with the innocent and bright faces of the children. Both the beadles and the patrons are concerned of their welfare. Hence they are brought to St. Paul Cathedral for their spiritual uplift. Here they raise their hands and sing songs in praise of God. The whole scene thus passes amidst a religious atmosphere. This happens particularly because the day is holy trusted. Such a day also produces a pure thought in the poet's mind. He asks us to cultivate sympathy as otherwise we may drive out an angel-like children from our doors unknowingly. Blake has drawn an impressive picture of the children of the charity schools wearing colorful uniforms. They are seen marching towards St. Paul's and the Beatles are carrying wands as they are act to as guides. And they are all going in batches. The poet is so moved by their innocent nature that he goes to describe even their little limbs as innocent hands. The children also possesses a radiant which is particularly their own. Their clean faces further create a favorable operation about them. The greatness of their number also produces a profound effect on our minds. They walk in batches wearing such uniforms as red and blue and green, while the white here produces a sense of discipline, the uh, sense of variety before which all the ideas of darkness and dullness are wiped out. They raise their little hands and sing in a deep, powerful voice in praise of God that is akin to spiritual active. Oh, what a multitude they seemed, these flowers of London town. Seated in companies, they sit with radiance all their own. The harm of multitude was there, but multitudes of lambs, thousands of little boys and girls, raising their innocent hands. Beneath them sit their old and wise patrons. All this produces sacred feeling. In tune with this, the poet asks us to cultivate a kind of sympathy, a great feeling. In tune with this, the poet asks us to cultivate sympathy, lest to send away an angel like child unknowingly from our doors. They are old and wise patrons sit below them. It is good to nurture sympathy, lest one such angel like child may be pushed away unawares. The children entering into St. Paul's like the waters of the Thames River. Again, it produces an idea of stateliness and abundance. Their freshness compels the poet to take the children up as flowers and their meekness as lamps. Now, like a mighty wind, they rage to heaven. The voice of song or like harmonious thundering the seats of heaven among. Beneath them sit the men, wise guardians of the poor. They and it is pretty lest you drive an angel from your door. Although in another poem having the same title that I am talking about in comparative ideology that has been included in Song of Experience, we have a different picture of the children. Here, however, uh, we get no direct sign which can be taken or interpreted as neglect of these children. Had they been really neglected, they would seldom have seen their faces clean, 
but the chance of they are looking like flowers or coming out of the radiance from uh, them would have receded further and further in such a state of neglect. Again, there is uh, the presence of the beetles who act both as their spiritual and earthly guides and that of the patrons who for their tender care of them and proper management of things have been rightly described here as wise. The poem is concerned with the holdings of a religious service, which has a beneficial influence both upon the children and upon their guardians. It asks the former to be more aware of God's blessing even for those who have to depend on charity and to praise Him for this and urges the latter to, to treat the needy and the helpless and to engage themselves in a greater act of benevolence. In fact, that is the Christian principles that to be followed. Now, if we take into the extremes poem, uh, the, I am just quoting few lines first. Is this a holy thing to see? In a rich and fruitful land, babies reduced to misery, fed with cold, and usurious hands. The primary objective of this poem, particularly this uh, experience poem, is to question the social and moral injustice. That social and moral injustice questioning is missing in innocence poem. In the first stanza, Black contrasts the rich and fruitful land that we have found in the innocence poem with the cold and usurious hands. Uh, and continuing his question, the virtue of the society, the virtue of the society, where the resources are abandoned and the children are still reduced to misery. Why? As you all know, on Ascension Day, a service was held in St. Paul's Cathedral for the poor children of London's charity schools. Now, the appreciation of the wise guardians of the poor that it mentions. Thus, advertising their charity may not be wholly shared by Blake's Piper, the supposed narrator of the song of innocence that we will find. In their state of innocence, children should not be regimented, rather they should be playing blithely on the echoing green. The children in the poem assert and preserve their essential innocence not by going to church, but by freely and spontaneously like a wind raging to heaven, the voice of the song. With his holy Thursday of the song of experience, Black's bard clarifies his view of the hypocrisy of the formal religion and its claimed acts of charity. He sees the established church hymn as a sham, suggesting uh, in following few stanzas that uh, the sound which would represent the day more accurately would be the trembling cry of a poor child. Is that trembling cry a song? Can it be a song of joy? And so many children poor, it is a land of poverty. The poet, now Black is here, we find Black as a Critic. The state that although England may be objectively a rich and fruitful land, the, un, the unfeeling, the profit-oriented power of the authority that designed for the innocent children suffer within, uh, within its eternal winter. The biblical connotation of these rhetorical opening points us towards Blake's assertion that a country whose children live in want cannot be described as truly rich, here he puts the questions. With the apparent contradiction of the true climactic opposites existing simultaneously within this geopolitical unit, we are offered a metaphor for England's man-made two nations, the poor and the affluents. And their sun does never shine, and their fields are black and bare. And their ways are filled with 
thorns. It is eternal winter there. If children are not providing food, if children are not taken care of, is it a summer? Is it a spring? No, it's a winter. For wherever the sun does shine and wherever the rain does fall, baby can never hunger there nor poverty the mind up to. It grew during the industrial revolution. As the industrial revolutions, there are some profit mongers comes in. They waged profit out of the labor of the children. The chimney sweepers, the poem where we find how the pathetic poor children are having that trafficking and the decadence of those poor parents who are nothing to survive in this barren winter. So here the entire poem of the experience questions this drab surrounding where, where innocence is being murdered by the name of revolution, by the name of Dratkin, by the name of progressive civilization. So many of the children, so many of the young ones, so many of the innocents of Christ, so many of the little lambs are butchered in the name of industry, in the name of civilization, in the name of progress. That is a winter London, a black London, which is far removed from Christly Pot. So I think you have got the meaning of these two poems and a little bit of comparative understanding of these two poems. I think your understanding will benefit you to further reading and if you find any of the questions in way of your understanding these poems, you can just ask me here. I will try my best to give answers. Like, share, comment and obviously subscribe to my channel to get this kind of posts and further. Bye bye.